Welcome to Conversations with Karalia, where we take a nuanced deep dive into all things related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. My name is Karalia, and I'm your host for this journey. I invite you to relax back, open up, and get curious. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share the love. Alrighty, people. So welcome to the next conversation with Karalia. I'm so excited because I finally got another man on the show. Uh, I just went and checked, and out of the last 12 conversations, only three have been with men, and they were like eight conversations ago. So today I am having a conversation with Tyron Mowbray, who is, let me just double check his Instagram profile, he's a leading masculinity mentor, helping men advance in their life, health, happiness, relationships, identity, wealth. Uh, Tyron is, he's like so intriguing to me. He's an Australian guy. He's a tradie. That's that's his trade. He's a tradie. Um, and he's got into all of this work through his own personal journey, right? So he's a real blokey bloke. He's like an Aussie blokey bloke who's done the conscious sexuality, the spirituality, the yoga, the shamanism, and has ended up doing men's work. And I just checked out his website to, you know, like just, oh yeah, better like just read through the bio, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the things that has happened to Tyron in his lifetime, he got busted growing marijuana. He was caught drink driving three times. He lost his license for over four years. Spent a few nights in the lockup, never had a stable relationship at this point. Um, the bikey gangs came and stood over him at one point, causing his girlfriend of three years to leave. He lost his house. He lost some of his closest friends. And then he spent two years in a deep shame spiral of drinking, drugs, and debauchery. He was totally addicted to porn. Um, couldn't even get an erection without porn. Like this guy was going down the tunnel. But you know what happens when we go down that rabbit hole, that tunnel, is that there's always a turning point, right? And that's what happened for Tyron. You know, since 2014, he found that turning point, And we'll find out more about that in our conversation. And he's gone on that journey of, you know, self-inquisition, of, of figuring out who he actually is and how he was operating in the world. Um, you know, and of course, as we do, those of us who, goes on those, who go on those journeys, so often we turn around and we begin to support, guide, and help other people who are going on these journeys. So one of the programs that um, Tyron has delivered in the last few years, I love this one, was the Tantric Trady. Now, I'm going to talk to Tyron about this, of course, because he's talking about Neo-Tantra, which is different from traditional Tantra. But I love that he literally pitched a program called the Tantric Trady. And one of the promises of that particular program was to eradicate porn use. You know, there's a recognition of how destructive porn use can be for men. So looking forward to being able to talk to Tyron about this and about just his whole body of work. So stick around people and remember that after the conversation, I'll do a bit of a reflection and a debrief. So make sure you stay for that as well. All righty, let's see what Tyron has to say. Tyron, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. It's <laughs> a pleasure to be here. <laughs> uh, where in the world are you? I'm in Burley Heads, the Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia. Epic. Uh, so I've had a bit of a dig around on your website and watched some of your videos, et cetera. I've been following you on social media for the last couple of years. I think probably found you via Dane Thomas. Yep. Um, you've had a pretty interesting journey into men's work, which you currently facilitate. Do you want to give us a bit of a rundown? Because you, you kind of bill yourself as, you know, the blokey bloke, the Aussie blokey bloke who played rugby league and was a tradie and all those things. But here you are embedded in the world of sexuality, spirituality, men's work. How did you mm. end up here? Well, uh, firstly, I played AFL, not uh, oh. rugby. Because um, <laughs> I grew up in Adelaide. Uh, and down in Adelaide, we don't even have rugby. Like, it's not even a sport. Like, it's just not, you know, no one plays it. So... Uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's an, it's a religion down there. And how did I end up here? Well, that's a part of it, to be honest. It's like, um, grew up in the, out in the country, 
rode my BMX everywhere from the ages of like, you know, 11 to, to 16 when I got my driver's license and then just used to drive around, you know, country roads doing burnouts and drifting and all the, you know, like, and then turn 18 and then you just go to the local pub every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, and playing football. And then, you know, when, then you mature to 18, you start playing a senior grade football and, you know, then you get indoctrinated into the football culture and it, it doesn't matter whether it's mm. union league, AFL, soccer, cricket, even um, any male dominated team sport, the, the, con the, the structure is very similar, right? It's like, you've got your old players who are the, the gurus, the teachers, and you know, like what they say goes, um, you've got your more adolescent players who have been in for a couple of years. And so that's, you know, they're usually the superstars because they're really good and fit and active. Um, uh, they're quite, they're quite um, insecure in many ways. So they're still trying to compete against each other and prove themselves. And then you've got your, your newbies like me who are just 18, just old enough, um, you know, maybe even 17, if you're a good youngster. And so, you know, you're looking at these, they're your peers, but but they appear to be mentors to you. You know, they appear to be further down the path, and so you take what they say as gospel. You know, so when they start telling you to skull beers and you know drink tequila and snort salt and squirt the lemon in your eye and you know have sex with as many women as you can and take drugs and get really fucked up and draw dicks on your face and jump off the roof butt naked, you know, and 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 all these types of things, it's like you do it because you want to fit in. You do it because it feels good to be uh, a part of something much bigger than you. And that's what these football clubs uh, or sports clubs represent. You know, they represent an entity or a being that is so much greater than the individual. And, and mm. we are now like a mini army on a collective goal or mission to win the premiership or the championship or the, you know, the, at the end of the season. And we go to war together every Saturday and we train together every Tuesday, <laughs> and every Thursday. And, you may not like everyone in the club, but you know when when you cross that white line, you will go. You will you will defend your teammates whether you like them or not. You know, and, and there's a really beautiful brotherhood in that. You know, like mm. I don't want to take away from that. Like there is something really beautiful about that for men in in the modern world that that we get to be gladiators and be warriors and without actually having to go to war and shoot people and kill people, which I think mm -hmm. is really beautiful. Um, but how would you describe the masculinity? Because, like, I know when I was growing up, when I was a teenager, et cetera, like, I would never go near men that played those sports because I, no, nah, I, I hung out with the surfers and the snowboarders and the skaters because they had a very different vibration, particularly with women. Mm. No thanks to the rugby guys. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I understand that. And um, what I, you know, when I, when I started doing the the spiritual journey, the, the kind of conscious, like, you know, embodiment and circles and feelings and expressions, I, I had not had that my whole life. So I loved it. You know, I was like, Oh my God, this is what real men do, you know? And, <laughs> but then also after being in that for like 18 months, I kind of realized, fuck, these men don't have my back. Like I wouldn't go to mm -hmm. war with these guys. Like I I might trust them talking about my emotions, but I don't trust them out in life. I don't trust them, you know, I, I don't trust them to not fuck my wife or my girlfriend because, you know, a lot of those guys are kind of pseudo-spiritual, neo-tantra, open relating, polyamory kind of, oh, I'm in integrity with my soul and blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, but where's the brotherhood, man? Like, like, mm. and sure, we may be in an open relationship, but we're not in a good place. And now you're trying to come in and, and I'm like, that's, like there's just there was not a lot of respect on the on the brotherhood human level um mm. but there was a lot of like you know i'm here for you man if you ever need to talk and 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 you know talking about far out concepts and you know dreamers and and spiritual ascension com concepts so yeah i i found that like if i ever needed anything in the real world those footy clubs those sports clubs mm -hmm. i i had an abundant hey guys i'm moving house 15 blokes there moving mm. house with you it was done in half a day everything was put where you wanted then you fucking had a big barbecue you had some beers and you talk shit and you had a great day you know like it was there was a mm. lot of camaraderie it was a lot of closeness but yeah to, to answer your question around like what type of masculinity is it i mean it's grounded in practicality it's grounded in let's say the more animal base level of of masculinity it's more primal it's more raw it's more not real but like I guess uh real life you know like it's it's 
they see and they feel and they express and that they don't go, they don't get lost in the far out concepts of the meaning of life and purpose and like, you know, the shamanic energies that move between all humans and stuff like that. And that's just because it's a muscle that they don't train. You, you, we don't mm -hmm. train that muscle, you know, whereas the surfers and the, and the skateboarders, like, you know, when you're out in the ocean for two hours surfing, mm -hmm. you're a bit more connected to nature, right? Like yeah. you're feeling the ocean and the waves and you've got to pick it up and, you know, pick, you know, when's, when, when do you drop in? When do you bank? When do you stand? Like, you know, you might see sharks or dolphins or sea turtles or fish. And so you're a bit more connected to nature. So they have that kind of closer relationship to that. Let's call it that more, you know, um, intuitive kind of mm. connection, to something greater than themselves. That's not an entity of other beings, right. Of, of phys human beings. It's a, a different energy. So. Mm. Those are know, some great I, points. Yeah. Yeah. It, and and I think. Interesting. Yeah. And it's not, neither is good nor bad nor better nor yeah. worse different frequencies like you were saying and um yeah. you know i like yeah they're just a lot more primal and they're a lot more locked in their let's call them lower chakras or base chakras if you will yeah but those types so of what guys. were you taught about women and like relationships to women and sex within the rugby <laughs> i want to know <laughs> one one you miss out on is one you never catch up on one you miss out on is one you never can. What do you mean by that? <laughs> so if you turn down the opportunity to get laid, you will never uh -huh. catch up on that opportunity, right? So uh -huh. it's like, because because then if even if you have sex with her later on, you will miss out on the opportunity to have sex with someone else that night. So oh you goodness. one you miss out on is one you never catch up on. That was uh, that was that was something that I was taught. So um, literally, like that saying, oh, that's oh my goodness, yeah, yeah. One you miss out on is one you never catch up on. You've got to slay a few dragons to get to the princess. That was <laughs> so what's that referring to? What what dragons are you slaying? Like, is that the women, women. that you're moving we through? Yeah, yeah, women. Like, you know, like, you you know, you, if you want to get to the princess, you've got to slay a few dragons. Like, you've got to, you've got to, I mean, you would say it basically when, you, when you're going to root a fat chick or an ugly chick or, a, you know, right. and I, I say those words from that perspective, you know, like, yeah, um, yeah like if you knew that the guys weren't going to, you know, if she wasn't a 10 out of 10 or even a seven out of 10, you'd be like, look, mate, you got to slay a few dragons to get the princess. It's like you were, you were disengaging any emotional yeah. attachment to this human by, by kind of being like, look, I'm, I'm going on a longer journey here. This thing's just in the way and I'm moving through this thing to get to where I want to go to. So yeah, it was a way to disengage emotional connection or attachment to the situations so that you couldn't be shamed or ridiculed for, you know, not having a good looking girl to, that you went home with wow so when when did it all start kind of falling apart for you as such like like because I'm guessing there was a bit of a turning point so you're you're in this kind of culture driving around the drink how did how did you get around driving and drinking all of those nights well we we're out in the country so there's a, yeah. a lot of not a lot of cops and there's a lot of roads um that being said i did lose my drink my driver's license for four and a half years for drink driving so i did get busted a few times um yeah wrote wrote two cars off um drink driving how, how'd you make sense of that at the time like what was the story you told yourself about it just unlucky <laughs> And it was because so because so many people were doing it so frequently. It was like, oh, I'm the one that got busted or got caught. It was yeah, like so it's every, very everyone, much the culture. Yeah, everyone does it on some. You know, not everyone did it as much necessarily, but everyone would go to the pub, get drunk, be over the limit, drive home. You know, that was that was common. Not everyone would stay awake for four days taking drugs and drive around in between. And I definitely did that a few times. Um, and and they were predominantly when I got busted. It was like you know pushing the limits, like you're driving around in the middle of the day when you haven't slept all night on the pills on the pills and it's like what do you what do you expect tyron you know like yeah yeah but at the time when you're in it you don't for you it's just like no i'll be fine i'll be i've, I've been i've done it he heaps of times i'll be fine you know so yeah um yes but it was it was it's just it was just unlucky it was just like well you roll the dice and you know ah, so what when did what happened to make you kind of wake up and get on the spirituality, conscious sexuality, that whole journey? 
And what was well, the I mean, arc? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, there's a point, obviously, but I think, and, and I'll share that point in a minute. But as uh, anyone that now can reflect on the past with some level of awareness and go, oh, look, the, the universe was slapping me in the face quite a lot to get away from that path <laughs> before, before I actually did it, you know, like yeah. the, the, the failed relationships, the, um, yeah, the drink driving, multiple charges, the, uh, you know, being busted by the cops with drugs, the, like, the, there were many, many times you know, near death, near fatal crashes in other people's cars, um, you know, mates getting arrested and, and, and taken by gangs, like the bikey gangs over here in Australia, like me almost getting taken by the bike gangs, like many, many times when the universe, the slaps, it's like a sheepdog, you know, like a sheepdog will herd sheep in the direction it wants it to go. And event, and if the sheep just go where it wants, like everyone just is happy and Larry, right. But if the sheep, tend to get a little bit too far left and too far right, the dog will start to bark louder and then it will come over and it will nip the heels. And then, and if the sheep still don't go, then it will start to like viciously attack the sheep a little bit to try to get it to move. And the universe does that to us. When you are off yeah. the path, the universe gives you little gentle, like, no, no, no. Over here. <laughs> and if you don't yeah. listen, it starts giving you real big, like left and rights. And I basically had to get knocked out in order to, to, to realize that, you know, so. Stubborn, uh, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I had, I had a girlfriend, we were together for three years. We had uh, a couple of houses together, a couple of dogs. I just got my, um, I, I lost my license again, but I was just about to get it back. Um, yeah, you know, we, we renovated a home and a house and made it a home. You know, we did everything. Our friends were getting married and having babies. And, you know, that was, we, we were 23 when we got together. So it was about, I was just turned 26. So it was kind of like looking like the perfect life and setup, you know, Mm -hmm. um and yeah i i'd been involved with a couple of people about trying to um do some drugs and make some money and the bikies found out and they came and stood over us and kicked the door in and um yeah you know she was home and it wasn't she didn't feel safe so she broke up with me which i 100 <laughs> percent understand did, did you feel safe in that Situation? No, no, not at all. No, I was getting <laughs> text messages and people were sitting parked out front of the house for two days and like, yeah, it was, it was intense, you know, but um, yeah. And so you just got it. That was, but that, that still didn't get me like that. She left. I still refused to take responsibility for what was going on. Um, and I got a job out in the mines in WA after that. And that, and I, I got, you know, we, she kept the house, gave me a little bit of money. I took a redundancy from work at that time. So I had all this money. I had like 45 grand. I owed my parents some money because they supported me in um, buying a house. And they were like, oh, why don't you pay us back? And I was like, oh, I don't have quite enough. I'm going back to work and then I'll just give you the whole lot. And all I just blew 45 grand, <sighs> like drinking drugs, partying, just in like yeah. four months, five months, like just blew it. Um, Yeah. And so... And then real bad out in the mines. Like, you know, the, the mining culture is probably worse than the football culture, right? Like it's, it's even more progressive. Like it's, it's a whole nother layer again. So, you know, I went out there and for the first four months was really bad. And then I blew all my money and I was earning like, you know, four grand a week, three grand a week and coming home. And you still blew the money. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and blew all the money I was earning. So like I ended up having yeah. a five grand credit card that was maxed out and no money in the bank. And so I would get paid. I would pay some money off my credit card. I would live for two weeks while I was off and use my credit card to, and max it back out again and then be away at work and not have to spend any money. And I was just in this loop. Um, yeah. And then, and that's when I kind of sat there. I was like, you are fucked, Tyron. Like you are. <laughs> like fucked. what's driving that? It's yeah. like mega self-destructive well, behavior, oh, right? Like massive, massive self-trauma, like self, yeah. you know, self-debilitating. I hate you. You're a piece of shit. You're not worthy of anything which was, you know, part of the bikey stuff. And I just never acknowledged how I fucked up there. So because of that, I never mm. dealt with emotions, which then just made me just suppress. And so eventually I cleaned up a little bit. Like I stopped taking drugs um, out in the mines because we got drug tested all the time. I still drank, but then and I knew I was fucked up and I was like, you need it. You need to rein in the drinking. So I stopped drinking when I was working for two or three weeks at a time. I would only drink when I had my week off. Um, and I would go to the gym and I, I went to the gym twice a day, but that was just me trying to fucking suppress. Everything. Yeah. It's like another addiction. It can be just another addiction. Right. And then yeah. porn was in the mix as well, wasn't it? 
Yeah. So a day out in the mines for me looked like 3 a.m. wake up, uh, jerk off, pre-workout, go to the gym, come back from the gym, jerk off, always to porn, never, never without yeah. it. Jerk off uh, at like fucking 4.30 or whatever it was afterwards. <laughs> afterwards. Have a shower, get dressed, go to the mess, eat breakfast, make lunch, go to work for 12 hours, um, come home, jerk off, pre-workout, go to the gym, go back to the mess, have dinner, go back to my room, jerk off, have a shower, go to bed. That was yeah. that was a day in in the life of Tyron for eighteen months out in the mines. Fuck, eighteen months of conditioning your body in that way as well. Like, yeah, that's yeah. some serious ass conditioning that you. Yeah. I'm guessing you then had to, <laughs> to rehabilitate. Yeah, yeah. So, um, the one of the tipping points again, still not the tipping point, but one of the tipping. Knowing that I'm getting worse, like I yeah. in my brain. I know that I'm getting worse, but I just don't know a way out, right? I've got yeah. no idea. So you, you, I'm guessing you're feeling pretty bad the whole time mm. as well with yep. just that little bit of relief working out, little bit of relief jerking off, you know, like those. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And so then, and then I was using Tinder like I was a shareholder. And so I, <laughs> I, I had, a, I was in Adelaide and Perth, right? So I lived in Adelaide still and I worked out of Perth. Mm -hmm. And I would, go, I would work for five days, have two days off, three days on, one day off, uh, seven days on, two days off. And then I'd have seven days off and I'd go back to Adelaide. Um, and so I would be using Tinder when I was in Perth, organizing dates for my two, three, four days off in Perth. Um, and then I would be organizing dates in Adelaide when I came back from my week off. And I would probably only jerk off twice a day when I was uh, back in Adelaide, but I would go on a date every day like every day and so when you're saying a date you're meaning a hook like these dates are going mostly through to six uh yeah i had a pretty i had a pretty good strike you get a hit run? Yeah. <laughs> um Were you my, my, it? well I, I wasn't counting but um but my <laughs> mission well I, I actually i was um yeah but my, my mission was to just have sex like it wasn't yeah i didn't actually care about the women the individuals it was purely about can i get sex can i get my idea yeah. in can I get my load yeah. off? That that was it. Um, Did it make you feel better? You no, know, like no, not at ooh. all. Like I would have stories. You know, I remember I I came back. I had sex with nine women in seven days. Uh, yeah. In this one little, you know, epic epic week. You know, and at mm. the time I was like messaging my mates, be like, "That's another one. That's another one." You know, and like, and then the desperation became so. It was like I didn't care who it was. Now, now I wasn't. It was just like I just needed to get another one to keep the role happening. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I organized three Tinder dates in one day, my first day back from, from Perth. And the first one, we went to magic mountain, which is like this game place. We were playing, there was a bit of tension. We made some jokes and I said, all right, 18th hole. If I get, if, if I win, I get a kiss. That was the rule. That was the rule, which is fun. You know, like that's a fun first date thing, but the tension was building and building and it was the last 18th hole. And I was like, all right, hole in one means a hole in one. And she just laughed and smiled and, bang got a hole in one and we went out into the ocean had sex at like two o'clock in the afternoon um and like you know i still have a smile on my face when i hear that story because it's still a part of me that's like yeah I, it's know, kind I, of fun I, the adventure yeah, like, yeah, yeah yeah exactly but it was always about the aftercare and the connection that i just i was a zero for like there was just none of yeah. that like i could not connect with these talk to these women again because my heart was so broken and so closed that to try mm. to re-engage with one of these women meant that I had to open a part of me that was just so painful I didn't want to look at. And that's upon reflection what I can see now. But when you're in it, you, I just, yeah. I, could, I had no idea. So yeah, so that was that. Um, I got to a point, I tried to masturbate without porn once out in the mines. I was like, wonder, wonder, I wonder what, wonder, what, you know, I was like, hmm, let's try that couldn't get an erection mm. 27 years old could not get an erection without porn or a woman um and even like a lot of these times these women i was having sex with like as soon as we had sex i didn't i didn't i was like i gotta get it i gotta leave i gotta leave i'm not even i can't cuddle i don't want to spend the night i'm like i'm out yeah because you yeah to be with what's me. happening yeah yeah and you know and i knew i was being a piece of shit i remember one i literally sat there and went she came to like snuggle up. I was like, no, 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 I don't do that. 
like I said it out loud and she was like what yeah. I was like oh, I don't I don't cuddle after sex and I was like I just I heard the word like it was like I was absent myself hearing me say that being like yeah you are a fucking piece of shit type. yeah like how many like you're the bad person and a lot of women's stories no doubt yep yeah yeah hundreds yeah yeah um and yeah so that no that no erection thing was i was like you're 27 you should be in the prime of your life like where are you going to be yeah. at 35 if you keep this up? Like, <laughs> fuck me tone so that was that was this that was probably the the tipping point where things started to change i quit porn i quit jerking off uh seven days later i had a wet dream so it took me mm. seven days to have a wet dream that kind of rebooted my libido um mm -hmm. and then I not long after went to Thailand for my mate's wedding and I was like, all right, I'm going to go do Muay Thai. I'm going to go do my scuba diving ticket again, do some more scuba diving. And like, I'm just going to reset. Um, mm. and I'm going to spend three days with the lads and do the wedding. And the rest of the month, I'm going to be on my own and sorting my shit out. I'm going to clean, you know, do my shit. I did a week of Muay Thai, then went to the wedding and then spent three weeks getting fucked up in Thailand and spent six grand in three weeks. Um, and I didn't even have accommodation. Like a lot of the time I just slept where I fell, stayed in my mate's accommodation. That was just me with drugs, alcohol and travel. Um, I nearly got arrested. I had all my shit stolen off the beach because uh, I was in the ocean having sex with some girl. Um, I just, I didn't, I fucking slept for like three hours a night for three weeks, basically. Yeah. And when I came back to my last night in Koh Samui before I was to fly home, the minds message emailed me and said, Oh, I was meant to go straight back to Perth and um, start work. I had a three weeks of solid work and they canceled all three weeks and I had no money. Like I just blown all my money and they like, they've gone, Oh, we've had some cancellations and you'll, you will not work until this time now. And I had a flight booked to Perth and everything. And, you know, my credit card had been stolen because of my back or my shit got stolen. And it was like, it was, I was just like in a shit fight. And I went down to the bar. I mean, I, when I say I had no money, I had a little bit of money. Um, enough to I, go to the bar. <laughs> yeah, enough to go to the bar. And I was like, fuck it. It's my last night. I'm just going to get drunk and pick up another girl like I have every other fucking night that I've been here. And I got really drunk really quickly. And I was on my own. And all of a sudden, I couldn't talk to anyone. Like the voices in my head started. And I just, I couldn't. I couldn't, I couldn't break the cycle. It was just like, everyone's looking at you. You're a piece of shit, blah, blah, blah. Like you're mm. weird. No one likes you. There was, it was just that started and it never, and it didn't stop. Right. And, so it kind of finally broke through internally. All yeah. those mechanisms you'd been using to hold it at bay for years. Yeah. Three weeks of three hours of sleep and drugs and alcohol. Just, just yeah. broke. Yeah. And um, you're 27. 27 yeah coming up and, sam, sam returns kind of <laughs> exactly, exactly that. so um what happened was um there was a young thai kid there who used to sell lays on the beach to all the drunk mm -hmm. tourists for a dollar and we'd seen him there two weeks earlier when when we were on that beach and um i was being a drunk aussie asshole and uh he was saying stuff and i was saying stuff and i was making fun of him and then he went to hit me and I kind of saw it coming. I moved my head and he hit the woman next to me. And I just laughed at him because I thought it was hilarious because I was like, cheeky little cunt trying to punch me and hit someone, you know, like just being a dick. And I saw him on the beach this time on my own and he came over and he started talking to me. And it, it broke me. It, I, I just, because in my mind, everyone on the beach hated me and I was a piece of shit. No one wanted to talk to me. And I, I was like just looping and looping and looping and this eight-year-old kid who I made fun of last time I was there just came up and was like, oh, hi, what are you doing back here? You know? And like his innocence just absolutely yeah. shattered my, my, my self-hatred and my, and I couldn't hold it anymore and it had to come out. And um, I just sat on the beach and cried with him for like two hours. Mm. Do and you feel a bit like his like his innocence connected in some way with your innocence that would have been there under it all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I couldn't hide that I was a piece of shit anymore. Yeah. 
you know, like I was that that's everything else was me hiding it and I couldn't hide it anymore. Um, he had a brother and a sister who were two and three. He lived with his grandma because his parents were gone or dead or something. Um, and I just couldn't handle it. And I like, I'm like, I went, we went to the shops and I was like, dude, you buy, buy, buy everything, buy as much. Like I was just like, you tire and you've just dropped six grand on like Losing nothing. Drugs. Yeah, nothing. <laughs> um, and he, he basically wouldn't spend any more than 20 bucks. And the first thing he bought was 25 kilos of rice. Mm. You know, and then he bought some lollies and yogurts and bought, you know, his kid, his sister's favorite lolly and his brother's favorite yogurt and his grandma's favorite this. And I was like, what, like, you, what are you, what are you getting for you? And he's like, no, no, I'm fine. I'm like, dude, <laughs> fucking like, what are you doing? Yeah. No, buy something. <laughs> and like, I, I just end up grabbing shit for him and putting it in the basket. And it was like $26 or something, you know, like it was yeah. 30 bucks. And then I, we put him in a car and I was like, go home, like, you know, go home. And then I went home back to my hotel room and cried for another 20 hours until I had to fly home and I got home and um, had two weeks in Adelaide, went back to the mines. I lasted two days and I just remember getting off the bus and everyone gets off the bus and walks down their little lanes to their dongers, which is their rooms. And you're like ants. And I just fucking, I just stopped in the middle of thinking and someone hits me like, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't fucking know, man. Like, why am I here? and I rang up and I was like hey I need time off and they're like you just had a month off I'm like yeah mental health I'm not good I'm taking a month off and um I'll finish my swings and then I'm done and then I rang uh my old bricky mate and he's like yeah yeah I got heaps of work so I just went back and moved in with mum and dad went back to laying bricks went back to my old footy club and and I reset, you know, and I lasted six months there and I bought a one-way ticket to Europe and I left. And then that started. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I had to leave. And, you know, that st- that's what started the the self-inquiry journey, you know. And mm. I didn't know where I, I didn't I didn't plan anything. There was no plan, you yeah. know. And I fucked up a lot on that journey. Like we could talk for hours about how many mistakes I made on that journey, but you know, I lived in a Buddhist monastery. I became a yoga teacher. I trekked across five countries. I lived in Iceland in the middle of winter, which means there was three hours of daylight a day. Um, yeah, I, I lived in communities of people and did inner child workshops and just, just you know, spent months and months living in my tent on my own, you know, yeah. in, in, all across Europe. Um, I walked a thousand kilometers across Spain on a pilgrimage called El Camino de Santiago. Yeah. Um, I just, I, I just explored. I just, I just. What did you broke. learn about your patterns? Like your, like what was it that led to the self hatred? I guess was the self hatred generated from how you'd behaved in your twenties, or were the deeper roots? Like, no, nah, it's always in a child. It's all, like it's always in a child, you know. And so yeah, relationships with parents, relationship with friends, just never feeling like you fit in ever, even though I was popular, even though I had people around me, always feeling like there was something different or wrong. You know, I was good at everything, but I wasn't great at anything, you know, like I was, and I never had to try hard for anything. Like I achieved everything easily, which then meant I never had to work for anything. And so then, and it sounds, it's really, it's, it's a, a double very, edged sword, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Like it, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm obviously kind of, <laughs> people were like, oh, that sounds like a really fucking hard life, Tyron. And I'm like, well, I under, I understand that it's very, um, privileged it's a very privileged life but at the you know and at the time it was like I I just don't know anything you know and I thought I did and when that collapse happened it was kind of like yeah it, it was just like well I don't know who I am and I don't know I, I know I know who I am I don't know how to express it all of a sudden because I kept a lot of me aside been told mm. that it wasn't okay you know especially in these hyper masculine environments so then that's what happened with the pendulum swing but for me, sex was always a massive thing. You know, like sex was massive. Like I'd had sex with hundreds of women. I've always wanted to have sex with women. I love having sex. I still love having sex with women. You are beautiful creatures and I, I it's it's awesome. I love it. Um, and what I went down the whole like abstinent yogic path and like, you know, with withholding and withstanding and saying no to that for so long, it something didn't feel right about it. Like it was like, yeah. I mean, I get the need to to not let it run rampant, 
Mm-hmm. And it, to cut it off completely also didn't feel right for me. Yeah. It didn't feel like the good thing to do. Um, and so, yeah, after the, all the yoga and the spirituality and the consciousness and the ascension and all that stuff, um, it was time to come back down into the body again. You know, it was like a mm-hmm. pendulum. Yeah, it was like, for sure. you know, and then I heard about ISTA, International School of Temple Arts, and uh, I heard about the retreats and I read it and it didn't make sense to me and I didn't know what the fucking anything was and I <laughs> scared the shit out of me and I was like, you know, it was more expensive than anything I'd ever done. Um, you know, I paid two and a half grand for a live-in three-month yoga teacher training in India and this this retreat was going to cost me three, two to, to participate for food in the com and to fly to Sydney and back, you know, and I'm like, that's a lot of money, you know, but I got four days in, I was like, I would have paid 10 grand for this. This was, this is mm. the greatest thing that I've ever done. Um, and then that opened even more doors and that led to the mystery school and the occult cosmology and mini sex cult thing. And, you know, joined joined a whole nother community of people that was just a whole different kettle of fish. Um, mm. The open relating conscious sexuality, polyamory, you know, purpose of the soul all that stuff. So when you dove into that and started exploring that after doing kind of the yogic thing where it sounds like you were in kind of full, you know, brahmacharya or, or celibacy. Yep. How how did you know that it just wasn't the old patterns reasserting themselves under the guise of conscious sexuality in terms of like, oh, now I can get away with doing it like this? <laughs> yeah. Uh I didn't. I didn't know mm. if it was or wasn't. And and to be honest, part of it was. Mm. 100% part of it was but the difference the difference for me was in one way I would not communicate with women about what I wanted whether it was just a one time sexual experience or this or that or whatever and in the other community it was you can have whatever you want as long as you're honest about it and open about it mm. and they they taught you what like how to have the conversation they gave you frameworks and constructs of you know look if you ju- if you just want to have sex with someone tell them you just want to have sex with them and it was like really like you're allowed to (laughs) I'm allowed to do that like (laughs) women are going to be okay with that like they're not going to I'm not going to be seen as the oh you're just a fucking man that blow like you know because that's the story that a lot of men get told quite a lot or or at least they get they believe that that's the truth and so yeah you know like it's the level one is amazing and I think all humans should not do it necessarily but have what that teaching like they should be educated in what they are teaching you know it's not just sex it's very much like energetic penetration like how how do you penetrate a space with your energy before you even penetrate a woman or a person you know and so there's a there's a lot there and their communication and they do a lot of masculine feminine stuff where they derobe the constructs and you know men talk about being men in front of women and women talk about women in being women in front of men and they dis demystify a lot of the like beliefs that we think we have or that we do hold about the opposite you know and Mm. it was it was massive like it was it was I walked out of that training like the highest on life I've ever been you know Mm. Um, and you feel like you belonged when you found yeah and was that the first time you'd had like you know when you did the yogic stuff etc we, yeah, we didn't. When did you first start to have more of a sense of belonging? Because you talked about never feeling like you fit in and going through the hyper masculinity of of football, mm. etc. Um, yeah. When did the first sense of ah oh, belonging start to unfold? Well, I think you know the the desire to belong is inherent in all of us, right? And if you yeah. go back to obviously tribal days, if you didn't fit yeah. into the tribe, you you died. So you know it's pretty inherent. <laughs> um, but for me personally that place like Easter and the training and, and those people it for me it was the first time that I felt like there wasn't a part of me I had to suppress you know like mm. I could I could be the primal animalistic part I could be the soft vulnerable gooey squishy part um I could be the aggressor I could be the whatever the surrenderer I could be all of it and obviously when you when you want to include everything there's a lot of opportunity for um misconception shadows coming out you know like power play dynamics and all that type of stuff and you know ista has a lot of um different reviews about it but i think for a place that is teaching personal responsibility it's still it's it's generations ahead of anything else that i've seen 
out there, right? It's inclusive of all things. Um, and that's it's a hard container to hold when you've got 30, 40, 50 humans and you are giving permission for them to be anything that they want um, as long as there's consciousness and, and communication and consent wrapped around it all. And so, yeah, but, you know, also when you've never felt like you belong, when you feel like you belong, you kind of go, this is me. And so then I dove all the way into that. And that's when, you know, I probably experienced more trauma in those containers than I did anywhere else because I actively pursued the not knowing of me in those spaces, you know? Um yeah, being open, relating, uh, being open and and having polyamorous relationships is really confronting. And when everyone's doing it, it's no no different to the football thing, right? Like have sex with as many women as you can. And now it's like, well, don't have sex with as many women as you can, but you're allowed to have sex with whoever you want, even if you're in a relationship and everyone does it and it's okay. And you just need to communicate and, and it's coming from the soul. And it's like, oh, but I'm having a real hard emotional process. Oh, well, that's just because you're not in your soul enough. So now there's this undercurrent. Yeah, that's shame. insidious, right? Yeah. Rather than maybe you don't want to be in a polyamorous thing. Maybe that's not your alignment. <laughs> yeah. And and I think um, and look, I moved through so much, and I'm I was I was very jealous and insecure in my previous life, you know, like, and I am much less jealous and insecure now, and I am a lot less judgmental on people's desires or quirks or kinks, you know, like. I, something I tell all my clients or even pre-clients like in the warm-up calls of like, look, if I haven't done it, I've experienced it. Or, I, or if, sorry, if I haven't done it, I've coached someone through it. You know, that's like, that's yeah. kind of frame now. There's not much. I still haven't had anything that's rocked me anymore since those, since doing all those trainings. And so it's like, that's a really cool place to be in. Cause like now if I'm with a partner and she's like, Hey, I've been looking at other dudes or I want to have a threesome with two men, or I want to do that. I'll be like, all right, cool. What does that look like? You know, how, how, what does that look like? I'm not like, yeah, fucking slut. I thought we were, you know, like, I yeah, yeah. Any, there's no, no, there's no judgment in me now. I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. I understand that desire. I have the similar desire, you know, like how, wh what do you need? Where's it? How's your nervous system feel? Blah, blah, blah. So I'm I really grateful. It. I'm really grateful for the whole experience while at the same time, I had to look at the most darkest fucking parts of myself in order to get comfortable with that and you know eventually I was so in it and I was looping because again for me this is the part where I was like the brotherhood part didn't you know the human primal part mm. didn't wasn't there for me personally and so I had to disconnect from that community and then reintegrate into this world and now when you say this world do you mean like the regular world like the, the world, world. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, the regular, day. yeah, where we're not like you know, not everyone is open relating and poly. I mean, a lot more people are exploring it, that's for sure. But, um, the world where we don't always have to sit in circle and process our feelings, and like you know, <laughs> and any, any, anyone that sits there and goes, I only have deep conversations, I'm like, well, you don't know how to have conversations then, because like, yeah, if you are only have deep conversations, you're addicted to other people needing to help you find the depth within yourself and mm. whenever and I, I think it's such an important part too is to integrate back into your timeline you could say like if that's what you grew up in to be able to go back and be at ease in those environments too as you are now and radiate what you do now like that's the actual work I reckon or or yeah. at least it you know that's the continuation of the work because if we're all hiding off in our little pods and you know in this kind of um, reinforcing, self-reinforcing world that's not disseminating out and integrating, we're not going to see the change that we all know is happening already. Yeah. <laughs> when like, you know, yoga, like yoga, right? The word yoga, the term yoga comes mm. from the Sanskrit word yuj, which means connection or union, right? Mm. And for me, that the spiritual path is is a path of connection and unity, not a, not a path of separation. Yeah. And so anyone that sits there and says, Oh, I'm spiritual and uh, your vibes off and I'm not going, no, no, no. And like, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you are, you are creating separation. Like us and them is separation. And if you are you're like the Buddha, Jesus Christ, like, like fucking Muhammad, all these people, they didn't, they didn't talk about, oh no, sorry. We, we don't like the Romans because they kill people. It's like Jesus Christ got killed by the Romans. If you believe in that he existed, got killed by the Romans and forgave them while on the cross, while being tortured. It's like, that's the level of 
non-separation he was capable of creating yeah and totally look we're not all jesus christ and i don't claim to be and i don't you know but the reality of we are humans we have emotions sure and not non-separation for me is the spiritual path and how do i create non-judgment non-separation in the world that i exist in constantly and that doesn't mean you can't put in boundaries but understanding like cool i'm just doing i'm not i'm not saying you're bad i'm just i'm just like yeah it's not something i want to hang around around right right now so what happened when you started to reintegrate back in with your older communities you know tradies football players etc how did how did that happen how did they see were they curious about your journey (laughs) yeah 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 100 percent so I mean, you know, I, I, I went back to Brick Lane a couple of times at the beginning, you know, and so all of a sudden I became a sex coach and then I was on a job site and, you know, guys are like, you're, you're a sex coach. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, 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 what do you mean? And I'm like, oh, well, you know, help guys have better sex with their partner and, you know, like this, that and tra- train the way you play. You know, you, you want to fuck for an hour, stop jerking off the porn for three minutes, you know, like it's like train how yeah. you play. And so <laughs> these little things you know, guys would be like, how do I get my missus to do anal? I'm like, well, do you do anal? They're like, no, no, I wouldn't do that. I was like, well, that's step one. Like step one, put something in your own butt so you know how it feels. <laughs> I'm not gay. I'm like, no, you don't have to be gay to put something in your butt. Like that's, you're gay if you like men and want to fuck men and be in relationships with men. That's what makes you gay. Um, not 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 putting a finger or, or a dildo or a butt plug in your bum, you know? And I'm like, and if you can do it for yourself, that's going to showcase to her that you understand how it works and that you, you understand, and she'd probably be a lot more open to it, you know? <laughs> and you know, the, and being able to hold that on a job site with like fifteen dudes, I love it. It's hilarious. I love it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, what do you do? It? I'm like, dude, three times a week. I've got a butt. Plug I've got in a, a butt plug in right now. Yeah, I came to work with one. Um, <laughs> I haven't done that yet, but that that would be that would be that would be quite funny. That would be. Interesting. I mean, I put one in and like vacuum the house and stuff. That's always fun. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um. But it triggers a lot of people. It yeah. Triggers a lot of, it triggers it's a edgy. lot of people. It's edgy. It's yeah. edgy. Um, I did watch, I'm just remembering now, I watched about a year ago, must have been, um, Tantra Made Me Gay, that three-way conversation that you had with Tane and Paisley. Yeah. I freaking love that so much. You know, yeah. that conversation. Um, yeah. yeah. Can you talk about some of the experiences that you may have had with men and the, and the temple spaces? <laughs> sure. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, like I was all the way in, right? Like you got to remember, I was all the way in. I drank the Kool-Aid. I was in this community. I was like, fucking let's go. And um, when 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 you are being taught about like non-duality, right? Like we live in a world of duality, right, wrong, up, down, black, white, hot, cold, dark night, all those things. Gay, straight, you know, it's like you're either gay or you're straight. It's like, there's, that's it. And when when you're in a community of people that are trying to live as a non-dual human right beyond the concept of masculine feminine right wrong good bad love hate you it's like peer pressure but not not in the way of like you've got to kiss a dude to be spiritual some people say that um definitely some some people are very aggressive in their desire for (laughs) non-duality um but you know i did get to the point where i was like i mean fuck i've always won yeah and i kiss i've kissed some footy mates multiple times like drunk trying to get girls kissed are you kiss you're like you and your mate just go fine and then like you know like that but to do it sober with with the curiosity with a you know whatever is very very different yeah being open to actually allowing any sexual feelings to arise in the moment yeah or (laughs) the potential for pleasure yeah right and so yeah look i've kissed fucking lots of dudes now um some of them are great some of them are terrible um (laughs) i've been naked with lots of dudes i've been in like yeah like i've touched lots of dicks i've had my dick sucked by a dude i've yeah, like I've pretty much done everything except actually had sex with a man. Mm. And and I just, I, like it's it's one of those things where it's like, okay, I've, I've pushed that envelope and I just don't really have yeah. a lot of desire for it. Like it's just not yeah. like, I'm not, yeah. Yeah, and I've had some experience like, you know, multiple men, multiple women, that kind of group of experiences. And I'm like, oh, in, in those types of environments, it's even more different because it's like, yeah, 
it's not so intimate and personal, you know, and, and, and yeah. when, when you're a more group experience, let's say there's two or three men and five or six women, cause it, or, or even two or three men and two or three women, it, it's kind of like, well, it's a group experience, you know, and that group experience, the energetically, everything kind of shifts because all of a sudden you're not focused on the person or the individual you're focused on like, where's the energy of everyone going? And so, yeah, like there's just, I had all of these experiences to on the other side of them be like, who am I now? Yeah. What, what, what's the reality that I want that I choose? Cause you get to choose your reality. You get to choose it every day, every day you wake up, choose your reality. But and, would you say you're choosing to be heterosexual though, or that's just the way you're wired? Well, okay. This is what I tell dudes and it fucks with their heads. Right. I was like, <laughs> if I was tied to a table and there were, six beautiful women in bikinis or like you know whatever and and they blindfolded me and I was like oh yeah this would be great you know and then those six women leave and six dudes come in and start touching me but I'm blindfolded and I didn't see the transition yeah. there's a fair chance that you know I am going to be aroused through that process right of course like if your eyes are um, closed do you know it's a guy or a woman who are, exactly you, yeah right so so it's like like Pleasure is a, is a construct like of, well, pleasure is an experience and we create a, a construct of meaning through our, through our senses. Right. Mm. And so, um, like I choose to be heterosexual. I believe sexuality and sensuality are fluid. I believe they are fluid into themselves. And I believe as an individual, right. Like, yeah, I've, I've been told my whole life that men like women and women like men. And yes, I love it when women like other women, like I'm not going to deny the part of me that it, it, that thinks that's okay. And it does seem to still be more socially acceptable than men liking men. Like gayness is okay, but um, it it is still more socially acceptable that women hold hands and kiss other women and stuff than, than men do. And I'm, I choose to be okay with that reality. Like I choose to, like I, the amount of work that it would take me to get to a place of bisexuality and being 100% comfortable with it, it's not something I want to invest a great deal of time of energy into. I feel like I've tried, I've, I've, I've played that card a little bit and I'm like, it doesn't feel like it's the most authentic expression of the life that I'm here to live. Yeah. It's not that I don't feel like it, you know, if I was in a relationship with a woman and we've been together for a while and we were opening our relationship to explore different things. And I don't mean open as in, we're just going to go fuck other people. I mean, within the relationship, the constructs can be open to include other people. And she wanted to experience two men. I, I could, I could definitely open to that and, and not like mm. we don't touch as in like, no, it's, it's like, you know, as it's a threesome, not a halfsome, not two men sharing one woman, but three people yeah. making love. I could open to that. And um, again, my nervous system would have to be on board and there would have to be some slowness and some, you know, not just like some random dude off the street. But yeah, I just, I just. That's a long I, way for a guy that grew up where you grew up in rural Australia and the culture, et cetera. I just want to acknowledge that. You know, like that's a long way from there. And it does show the depths of the work that you've done and the depths of like kind of deconditioning and exploration. Um, yeah. And I just wonder what would happen if lots more men felt empowered to or were able to examine their own internal biases around some of this stuff. And I guess you being on job sites and talking about it <laughs> is dropping little seeds. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a hundred percent it is. Um, the way that I look at it is like, not everyone has to, you know, like I, I don't believe in the utopian dream that if everyone gets to a certain point, then the world will be perfect. Like, because yeah, it's already the, perfect in its own yeah, way. Yeah. And the world is dualistic. Like that's why the world is here. Like we are here to have a human experience, which is the, du the dualism of like good and bad, right and wrong pain and pleasure. So, you know, the world can't be out of balance. There has to be an equal amount of everything, but that, but that doesn't mean that it can't be like the 50% of this isn't pushed into the 10% of those people, which is why it comes out in a shadow form, you know? And so, yes, I do believe that if everyone worked on their own sexuality, sensuality, emotional processing stuff, you know, worked on their dark a little bit more. And when I say dark, I don't mean like 
bad dark. I just mean like darker stuff, like their animalistic primal more and integrated more of that. It would alleviate a lot of the tension in the world because we wouldn't, it wouldn't get played out in the shadow so much. Mm. And I think that's what happens. So yeah. yeah, I do, I do believe that it would make a big global transition. But the reality of like, how do you do that? Like you, you, you can't get, you can't be Tony Robbins and put fifty thousand people in a room, and in five days, um, like yeah. get them to integrate their dark. Like it just, it just, it doesn't work like that. The, the that type of work is very, very different. And I've don't get me, you can have big rooms. I've had, I've seen big rooms. I've been in big rooms of big people doing it. But the aftercare that is required for the integration of the shit that comes up. Yeah, it's huge. You know, and, yeah, and that's the biggest sh- shit that I see in a lot of sexual containers and like, you know, even ISTA to some extent and and a lot of the others is they, they everyone wants the intensity. It's like, yes, do this, let's do this, let's yeah. do that. And then the week after, everyone goes home and goes, well, hang on, I just had a group experience with 50 people and it was amazing and loving and joyous and now I'm out back in the world and the, the coffee person abused me because of the, I didn't have the right change. And so the, 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 the duality of like this beautiful loving experience where 50 people could love each other. And I don't mean sex. I just mean love each yeah, other. Yeah. Genuinely heart connected folks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it could be inclusive of a lot of stuff that our normal society doesn't include compared to going to the normal society and people, drunk people yelling at you on the street and stuff. It's like mm. that creates a real fracture in the mind and that integration process can take a while. And I don't see a lot of support for the integration after deep in-person work. And, you know, that's yeah. part of like the Academy that I've created now. It's, it's not six week programs because sure you can learn one thing in six weeks, but you'll only learn one thing somewhat well, and then you've still got to integrate it. And so, you know, if, if, when I run my in-person events now, my five day ones, there is a six week integration online process that comes afterwards because mm. that's what is nest at minimum. That is what is required. Um, Aftercare and, integration. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and that's a men's only event. So like if you throw women in there and you throw in sexuality, it's like, well, that, that should be like three month aftercare minimum, you know, like it's, yeah. it just amplifies that stuff. Um, and that's, that's probably the one that's probably the, where, some of these sexuality places really let themselves down. It's like, it's not that they don't do good work. They do good work, but then they just let people go. And yeah. then, you know, the trauma comes up and they don't know how to process it. And then people blame the retreat for what happened and the facilitators for what happened. Or even though they were actually in the perfect consent the whole time, but it's the integration part that they're struggling with. And so then yeah. in a world that loves victimhood, we want to find someone to blame. So what do we do? We, we blame the facilitators, the retreat, the, the world, the whatever. And it will be great if there was way more aftercare and integration after that kind of depth and intensity yeah. of work. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and then also, sorry, there just needs to be the point of like, at some point you've got to give them responsibility. It's like, okay, we can't look after you forever. You do yeah. have to be able to do this on your own. And that's different for everyone. So you can't, I don't think you can create a rule because everyone needs individual stuff. And that's, that's where yeah. people come stuck, you know? Yeah. It's challenging. Um, I'm aware of time and I'm loving the conversation and I really want to talk about porn, which we haven't really talked to. We've kind of touched sure. on it a little bit. Yep. Um, I was checking out some of your offerings. And one of the things that you have offered in the past is the tantric tradie. And the number one thing at the very top was to eradicate porn use. Right. And I know that addiction to porn was part of your journey. So Yeah where are you at with porn, how it plays a role in men's sexuality, what's the right relationship with it? Let's go. All right. So <laughs> I, um, I was, a, I did a talk a couple of weeks ago at a thing up here called enlightenment in the bedroom. And I talked about how porn can help your relationship. Um, because I have this, uh, I mean, I am a, if you look at NLP, I'm a mismatcher, right? Like we're, people like to hold a frame. I want to hold the opposite frame. I've got it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It. <laughs> and so, yeah. And so, you know, the, this, this war on porn that has been going for a long time and I was a part of it cause I, you know, it, it destroyed me. I just, I get sick of it almost, you know, people are like, Oh, porn's bad. Porn's bad. Porn's bad. Porn's bad. I'm like, I'm sick of hearing about porn being bad. So, you know what? Porn's good. Porn. I, I just, I just want to argue. For the sake of arguing. <laughs> but um 
so the, the construct of porn, like you could say, oh, drugs are bad or McDonald's is bad. It's like, well, it's a service that exists because people want it. Now, if you blame the service, what you're doing is you're taking people's self-responsibility away, right? So all of a sudden now, oh, it's not your fault. You've been watching porn for 20 years, so you're numb. You watch the fucking porn, mate. Like it's your responsibility. You still need to take responsibility. And so porn wouldn't exist if we weren't such a sexually repressed and suppressed population, which is very interesting considering we're the most sexually liberated we've ever been, right? And so it's like, well, you know, there, there's, there's people having more sex, there's dating sites, you know, the, the sexual liberation for women, women are having more sex. Uh, so men should be having more sex and that means more people should be having sex, but the quality of the sex is really shit. The intimacy, and, right? Right. Not just the bodies creating friction. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, you know, for me, if, if I talk about my experience as a man and I'm unfortunately or fortunately, I'm, I'm a normal dude, right? Like my experience is not different. <laughs> Fairly typical, I'd say. <laughs> Fairly typical. Um, I got, I, my sexuality was never supported or, or celebrated as a, as a young man, mm. right? Ever, ever that I can remember, ever except by other dudes. And so that was why we kind of was like, oh, you fucked it. Oh yeah, well done, man, high five, you know? And so it was like, that was why, me- that's why men have this debaucherous nature is because we actually celebrate each other's sexuality, which is something that doesn't get celebrated by anyone, anywhere at all. Um, and I'm all for f- female sexual liberation. I'm not, so I'm not holding the frame that you guys are be- worse or judgment or whatever. Yeah, it's just- You're just talking just to your thinking- journey. Exactly. From a man's perspective. So when, um, and when a man has to suppress all of his emotions because he's told that, you know, big boys don't cry and blah, 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 blah. The only way men can feel is through the physical. And so sex actually is the deepest form of intimacy we can experience as men, because we don't know, we, we don't have the pathways. We haven't like cultivated the neural pathways of emotional intimacy, emotional connection, that type of stuff so for us sex is it and an orgasm is connection to god the universe source enlightenment whatever you want to call it so when and sure we can do it on our own don't get me wrong but it's nothing compared to being somewhere between three to eight inches inside of a woman and feeling the connection (laughs) between the two of you and and although it may be friction and stuff it's still if a woman lets you inside of her body, it, it gives you validity as a man. It makes you feel worthy of love. Uh, and then this was my experience, right? So yes, there was the part of me that was like the more women I had sex with, the, the more masculine I felt, but it also meant that I was, wor- I, there was a part of me that felt worthy of love. It's like, if she lets me in, then then I'm worthy. I'm, I'm okay. Obviously I didn't feel that myself, which is why I was trying to constantly get it from any women. So when my, when my sexuality as a man has never been celebrated and then I find this thing called pornography where they are doing things and, you know, the man is the main uh, character in a lot of porn. A lot of porn is, is male dominated. Um, it makes me feel good about being a man and being a sexual man and having all these desires and quirks and kinks and fantasies. And so it gives me a sense of liberation when I watch it mm. in an area that I have felt shamed most of my life, most mm-hmm. of my adult life. Mm-hmm. And so that's what creates the addiction. It's like, well, and then if I go to a, I go on a date and I talk to a girl and I'm like, oh, I'd love to, I'd love to like choke you. Fuck off. You weirdo. I don't want to be choked. That's fucking gross or bad or disgusting or blah, blah, blah. Shamed. What do I do to get liberation from that shame? I go watch, porn where the dude chokes the chick yeah. and i'm like but it's okay and so this is the the part where you know the disconnection of like so that well what why would i possibly get rejected by you and shamed by you a woman who i love and want love from and want to be loved by when i can go and do this thing and feel liberated and be okay and you know now obviously train how you play i'm creating a neural pathway where now my sense of liberation comes from a screen my sense of arousal comes from a screen not from a human and so you know, like i'm not saying it's good i'm just talking about the, the internal process that happens yeah. right yeah um 
Now then obviously what happens is the dopamine keeps getting spiked. And so now choking is not enough. Now I need gangbangs. Now I need, you know, de- uh, like full blown fucking, um, what's it called? Uh, asphy- asphyxiation, you know, now I need fucking yeah. midgets, fucking goats. Now I need, the, you know, it's just like, that's the dark, the dark yeah, web doing- porn. Yeah. It keeps going. And then, and then we get really stuck. You know, it's like they talk about marijuana being a gateway drug, right? So no, I just smoke a bit of weed here and there. And the next minute you're shooting up heroin. It's like, there's a, there's a, it's a gateway permission piece. Um, now that being said, having done all the journey I've been on now, I know lots of women that love to be choked a little bit and like to be dominated and like to be submissive and like to, you know, like, it's like there are, because I exist in the world where women have done that work on themselves. Yeah, it's and, been explored from a yeah. empowered sense and a choice exactly. sense. And exactly. a, I want this. No, I'm not doing this to please him. <laughs> exactly. You know, and yeah. so, you know, the, yeah, but the porn thing, like ultimately it is, it is giving you like any addiction, it is giving you some emotional need yeah. you like there is yeah. an emotional need there that is driving it and a lot of men it's it's liberation from sexual shame yeah uh, and a level of intimacy and so that's what they use every time they feel anxious every time they feel shame every time they feel rejected they turn to this because it gives them a sense of liberation yeah it's not long lasting because afterwards they obviously mm. still feel disconnected because once they turn the screen off and they've ejaculated then then the dopamine drops and so then they're like well fuck now I feel even more lonely and so then you know, especially I'm, if they beat themselves up for using the porn it's a double whammy exactly right <laughs> yeah so yeah um yeah for me like you know and so when I wrote um why porn is good for your relationships like 50 shades of gray fastest selling paperback in UK publishing history you know sex toy sales went up 800 percent in the UK when that book came out uh, those the three movies they had a budget of 55 million each which is you know pretty reasonable together all three of them collectively grossed 1.32 billion dollars mm. so like women want better sex too right like and that was predominantly from women right predominantly women bought those books yeah. read those read those uh sorry bought yeah bought those books watched those movies and bought sex toys and this is and it, it's 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 i've read one of them and i've watched the movies it's average at best, right? Like yeah, it's, yeah. it's average. Yeah, at best. I read them. I was like curious. But yeah. in, a, in a world where- There's a pathway that's like, though, right? Well, that's right. In a world where our sexuality is, we use sex to sell everything, but we don't educate anyone about it. Yeah. Uh, it's like how do you so, explore? How do you find these places? How do you feel good in these places? Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, women want better sex. And if you are a man and, and you know, I think the topic porn is, it's like, oh, fast food. Well, McDonald's fast food and Zambrero's fast food, they're very different. Zambrero's is much better for you than McDonald's, you know? Mm. And then there's, and there's even more than that. So porn is a, is a sliding scale. There's a lot of beautiful conscious porn being made these days. Um, Erica Last is a really beautiful, you know, it's still very real, very raw, very in your face, very full frontal, but it's very connected. And, you know, it's, it, it's artistic as opposed to just hard and yeah. fast, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and when the energetics in alignment, right? Because that was the thing for me as a young woman, like early 20s or whatever, when I happened to stumble across porn, what I noticed was I felt like I could energetically feel what was true for the women. And often I felt like those women were not genuinely consenting and it made me feel really icky, Yeah, you know? And, and yeah, porn when it started was, was good. Like in the 70s, 60s and 70s, porn was actually like, you know, they had storylines and, you know, it was like, it was actually pretty back then it was a movie that had a lot of sex in it as opposed to now it's manipulation and and you know like let's have sex in a van or on the couch you know people they like oh you want to be a porn star okay fine i'm going to record you sucking my dick now and then publish it on the internet and you never get paid you know like that was mm. that, that's the, the 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 shadow side of it all but when porn started at, you know it was a massive thing in in hollywood and, and california it was it was a lot more about a lot of it was a, a like it was the proper studios, you know, it was filmed that had like storylines. Um, I starred in a erotic film for a, an erotic film festival called Erotica. Mm-hmm. Uh, with a couple of women who I know who, you know, they want to make porn for women. They're, they're, they're 40 year old women and all the porn out there is made for men. And they wanted to make this beautiful artistic, you know, because they hired this beautiful Airbnb. We had a professional videographer, and we had an amazing shower scene, you know, and it's, it's hot as fuck. Yeah. And I like it. And 
I think if men remove the need to see all the graphic things and watch like erotic films with their mm. partners, that is going to entice and seduce the partner a lot more. And then you can talk about what you liked and what you didn't like and what you would be open to exploring and what you wouldn't be open to exploring. Cause we find it really hard to communicate about sexual desires, mm -hmm. men and women together in a yeah. relationship. So it's edgy as right. Brings up all yeah. kinds of stuff. And as soon as the body goes into fight, flight or freeze, it's even harder to have those conversations. Yeah. Right. So, scared of what he might think of me, scared of what she'll think of me. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, porn satisfies an emotional need. And if you understand what that emotional need is, then you can curb the porn addiction. That's that's mm, yeah. just like any addiction. Yeah, it is. It's understanding the relationship, right? What's giving rise to the desire to use this particular thing, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Epic. Okay, to close off, um, you work with men now. What kind of men are you working with? And like at the moment, what's the kind of, are you seeing any themes coming through? Or what, you what are you really excited about in the men's work you're doing? So many things. Um, I see, I work with a lot of dudes that have just come out of a breakup. Mm. A, lot, a lot of guys come out of a breakup um, or borderline breakup, you know, like they're basically having heaps of relationship issues and they're like, she's given me an ultimatum. I don't know what to do. She pointed me in your direction or some friend of me, mine pointed me in your direction. I'll do anything. And so a lot of them get to that point where it's like, it's, it's, it's breaking point already. If it, if not already broken, um, so that's probably the biggest theme. Um, it used to be a lot of single dudes. It's currently 50-50 right now. Um, but yeah, a, a, most of those are like second, third relationships. Not many of them are first. Some some are first. Predominantly, they've gone through a breakup. They're either broken up and working on their shit or they're trying to get back together and working on their shit or they're in a new relationship and their shit's coming up and they, they're like... Yeah, they recognize the pattern. Exactly. So... <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Typically speaking, the younger guys are single and it's the older guys that are in a second relationship, you know? And so basically anything under 33 is usually single dudes and anyone over 33 to about 55 is usually in a, in a relationship. Not always, but like they're the common yeah. themes with, with dudes. Um, and as, and a lot of them is like, you know, they just want to fucking be better lovers to their partners. They want to give them more mm -hmm. pleasure. They want to, they want, you know, a lot, some of them are really lost. They're like, I've given her everything and she doesn't love me anymore. And it's like, well, it's because they've lost the masculine frame. You know, it's like they became the nice guy. They became the yes man as opposed to the yes and no man. And the woman doesn't respect their yeses anymore. It's pretty common, you know, like we dated, you love me because of the man that I am. Once we enter that committed relationship, now I'm in service to you and I want to do everything for you. And all of a sudden I'm not the man you fell in love with. I'm a different man that's now just in devotion to you, which sure is kind of cool, but no one wants mm. everything they want. Like women specifically don't want everything they say they want. They say they want it. Um, well, it's unnerving because if he'll do that for me, that means that he's got no center. And he, if he's got no center, I can't trust him. Exactly. If I say yes to everything, how can you trust my yes? Totally. Cause you'll be easily manipulated by anybody. Yeah. Cause I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm overriding my own masculine, yeah. my own feminine. So yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so a lot of that's coming back to a masculine frame, um, giving them self-pleasure techniques and tools, giving them emotional processing tools, healing their own inner child, uh, giving them initiation processes, helping them understand the, the energetics of relationship, you know, polarity, duality, fullness, communication, emotional connection, all those types of things. Big one is teaching them that their women want uh, transparency, not vulnerability. Um, that's a big one. Oh, wait. What do you mean? Like, what do you mean by that? Women want transparency, yeah. not vulnerability. So I got this from mate of mine, Blaze Grinner, uh, on my podcast. And uh, I've thought this for a long time, but he just worded it better than I ever have. And that is that if we, if we are in a relationship and I'm typically holding the masculine frame and you're typically holding the feminine frame, which is predominantly most relationships, um, you can tell when something's up with me, right? Women have a yeah. beautiful intuitive sense. And, and if something's not right with me, you can tell. Now, if I am feeling hopeless and worthless and, and whatever, and you're like, what's up, babe? What's up? What's the matter? And I collapse and I completely and utterly collapse and be like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm hopeless. I'm fucking blah, blah, blah. 
women want to believe that that's what they want. Like, no, I want him to share all of his insecurities and doubts. And some of you can handle that a hundred percent, but to be honest, not many of you can. And because just like we need to work on our feminine, you guys need to work on your masculine. And so if we've always held the masculine frame, if we collapse in that completely, like too much, you can no longer, again, trust our, our ability to hold the container of the relationship to be the rock. And so I don't believe that most women actually want that complete and utter vulnerability. They want transparency. They want They want to know, you would want to know that I know something's up in me and I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying men shouldn't break, men shouldn't collapse, men shouldn't express. They should. They should know where to do it and who to do it with. Yeah. And that's why the men's groups, the men's circles, that, that's why they're important. And, you know, also if you read um, Esther Perel's Made in Captivity, she talks about the difference between love and desire. And like sometimes the more love that is present, the less desire there is. Because what mm -hmm. happens is the two individuals become one individual and one individual, there's no passion there. There's no, yeah. there's no curiosity. There's no mystery. There's no, you know, whatever. And I've got my own constructs that I maps and models that I teach the guys in the academy about this, you know, relationships from the head and relationships from the heart. Um, the head is like structure systems, you know, planning. The heart is like mystery, chaos, love, passion, fire, all those things. So if I go, look, babe, yeah, some, something's up. I'm going through some stuff. I've got my men's circle. I'm in a program. I'm doing this. Please, please just trust that I'm working on it. Uh, but, and, and if I need anything, I'll let you know, but like, please just trust that I'm working on it. Yeah. I see the difference. It's, it's Feels real different. Yeah. It, you, I'm, I'm not disproving your intuition. Like you're not, yeah. you're not, he's hiding something from me. He's hiding something from me. What's going on. Yeah. You can feel that I know I'm letting you know that I know, but I'm not telling you what it is. Cause it's not your job to stress. It's my job to stress. Yeah, because as soon as you like said it in that vulnerable way, what I notice in me is like, yeah, I can hold that. But what comes up, I'm like, yeah, you need to go sort that out. It's not my job yeah. to. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you, because yeah. as soon as I do that, the polarity has gone and the sexual vibe's gone. It's just like, it's not, I don't want to play that. <laughs> yeah. And, and what happens is in two or three weeks when I have gone to my men's group, I process my shit and I come back and I walk back in the house and I've fixed it internally. I come back in the house and you look at me and you're like, fuck, you just took care of business. <laughs> I want, I want you now. What are you, yeah. What's going on? I want, cause you, cause, cause I fixed my shit and I didn't yeah. need you to do it, which then makes the the polarity of like, I can trust him. Look, what happened? Yeah. Fuck, he's a provider. He's a protector. I want him. So women want transparency more than vulnerability. Yeah. And, and after the fact, I could then communicate with you if that is a part of our relationship. Hey, what I unpacked was that this happened, this happened, this happened. This is what I did to resolve it. And this is where I'm at now. Maybe, maybe yeah. some couples are good with that. Some aren't, you know, like every relationship's individual and unique. Um, if I was with, I hate saying the term, if I was with a conscious woman, like a woman that had the awareness to to dance in both polarities and and she wanted to know and I felt like she could hold it, then, then I would communicate after the fact. Yeah. But not during. Yeah. I like that. That's that there's a real um, potent subtlety on that. Thanks for sharing. I'm sure people are going to get a lot out of that little piece. Yeah, no worries. Cool. Um, anything you want to throw in to tie up? Masculine integrity is I'll do what I say regardless of how I feel. Feminine integrity. <laughs> feminine integrity is I will do what I feel regardless of what I said. Okay, so let's just let's just say this. You say the first one slowly. Embody it as you say it, please. Transmit. <laughs> Masculine integrity is I will do what I say regardless of how I feel. Mm -hmm. Feminine integrity, I will do what I feel regardless of what I said. I will do what I feel regardless of what I said. I'm going to just sit with that one because I've been real big on the, the other one. Like That's how I tend to roll, but I will do what I feel regardless of what I... Yeah, I can... Mm. And I'm, we both have both and I'm not trying yeah. to say masculine is better than feminine or feminine. Yeah, I'm, yeah. What I'm saying is, you know, when we get, when a man gets, typically when a man gets angry at a woman, she's like, she said she would do this thing and she's, you know, whatever. It's like women follow what they feel. That's, that's the beauty of the feminine, typically speaking, right? That's their integrity. That's their intuition. No, babe, I don't feel like doing that. It's like, well, what do you mean? You don't feel like it. We said we would be there at 10 past seven. That's what we got to do. Mm. So 
you know, and when you swing too far to one side, a masculine man that stays in that will override his feelings all the time. And so good. Yeah. You know, but yes, then it's knowing own... which one to honor, isn't it? Do I honor what I said to hold that integrity or do I honor what I feel? Because we've got to really allow feeling to lead as well. Or, or do you tune into right. your feelings and then only make commitments based on what you feel and you know to be true so that you can see them through all the way? Is, is that any full integration of it? <laughs> Epic. Epic. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's been amazing, illuminating. Yeah. No worries. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So that was Tyron Mowbray. And I feel like I gained a lot from that conversation, particularly toward the end. I'm going to sit with some of those things. I feel like there was some aha moments for me. And just again, want to acknowledge and honor Tyron's courage and willingness to go into areas that traditionally kind of blokey bloke Aussies probably wouldn't have gone there you know um loved hearing some of the insight on his journey into ISTA it's interesting you know how many people on this podcast have had experiences with ISTA and getting all of it's like the diamond has so many different facets right getting all of the different perspectives on it um the different yeah the different views that people have held on ISTA from their experience Okay, so I think that's done and dusted. Let me see if there's anything else I want to add about this one. Nope, I think we're good. I think we can play. Thank you as always for watching Conversations with Caralia. Please do like, share, follow, particularly on Facebook because I'm not on Facebook anymore. Share it out into relevant groups because that tends to give it a bit of juice. All righty, enjoy the rest of your day and sending so many blessings your way. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Karalia and trust that you enjoyed that nuanced deep dive into spirituality, sexuality, power and awakening. If you love my take on the spiritual path and you're looking for more insights like this, then make sure you subscribe and like. You can also check out my website, karalia.com. That's K-A-R-A-L-E ah.com and subscribe to my weekly newsletter.